Most of the conversations on this podcast talk about maps and satellite images, nearly all of them focusing on mapping the outdoors. But what does it actually take to map indoors? Satellite images, autonomous cars, and capturing images, or even GPS traces that help map roads and cities don't work indoors. So today's guest is Hongwei Liu. As a student, he started Mapton, a company focused entirely on indoor mapping. I like doing my research when preparing for these conversations, and in doing so, I found that Hongwei was someone that does a lot of thinking around the nature of companies, work, and people. I'm starting to believe this podcast might, in fact, simply be an outlet for me, luring people in to at first talk about maps and then ending up discussing the meaning of life. Nonetheless, this was an interesting conversation about the technical hurdles of mapping the indoors, but also building a company and the reasons to do so. Before that, this episode is sponsored by SkyFi. I talk a lot about satellite imagery on this podcast and how many people use them for all sorts of applications. Though one of the biggest challenges surrounding these satellite images is still just getting your hands on them. It's so far usually been a hassle of prices not being upfront or having to get on a sales call before buying any images. SkyFi wants to change that. They're partnering with many of the imagery providers to make it as easy as possible for anyone to just use their credit card and buy imagery, either tasking a new area or ordering from a catalog of existing data. This is what buying satellite imagery should always really have been like clear and upfront pricing and availability. If you want to easily buy satellite imagery, SkyFi is quickly becoming the place to go. So head over to skyfi.com. They've also recently announced the support for free and open data on their platform. Specifically, they're starting with Sentinel-2. So if you want to get some free images or pay for some higher resolution ones, SkyFi is the place to go. I don't know if you're aware, but I like starting these conversations the same way every single time. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. I'm quite curious, how would you describe yourself? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm quite excited as well. Um, I guess I would describe myself as a regular kid from Ottawa who accidentally had a child 12 years ago called Mapped In. And since then, my life's been really different than a lot of other people. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that that same kid is still there. Uh, and, and all, all of that person's original, you know, like I, that's still me. Um, but so much of what I do now is around r running a business and, and all the really cool things that I've gotten to see since. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I hope that, you know, I'm a good person trying to work hard and, and do something great. I think I've heard people describe their projects as like their baby and the, like what they're doing. It seems like it's something that you is very close to your heart. Like just calling it your kid is, it's very attached. It's not like something that, you know, is, oh, it's something that I do amongst a lot of things. It seems like you're very attached to the, to the work that you've done there. I think it's a combination of attachment, love, but also responsibility, right? So, um, I, I say this tongue in cheek, I, I, uh, I didn't prepare for that answer so that was just top of mind. But when I explain to my friends why I live in Waterloo and why they never see me anymore. And it's like, <laughs> you know, the, the fun, the funny way to put it is I accidentally had a kid. This is called mapped in. I have to raise it now. It's been 12 years and there's probably six more, um, at least. Right. Um, and, and I, I used to, there were probably years, maybe five years ago when I was traveling all the time living in the back of the plane. And I was thinking, oh, this, geez, like, how, what did I do wrong to end up here when all my friends are working at Apple or something like that? Um, but it's also, I think, a, a tremendous privilege, obviously. And, and I, I think any, I would say most of my friends would trade places with me. Uh, and there, you know, obviously there are some days where I think, you know, that life could be easier than this, um, but it's it's been fun. So I, I think that the kid thing is both, I think for some people, it's very intentional. Um, I'm like the accidental parent and I'm, I'm doing my best here. I kind of get how you get an accidental kid like that. I can visualize. How do you get yeah. an accidental company? Um, so Mapton was a school project. It was, uh, you know, we were first year University of Waterloo. 
I was living in a residence that didn't have air conditioning, and I heard that there was a residence that did have air conditioning. It just also had this entrepreneurship program, which no one really knew what that was back then. It wasn't very popular. Uh, but I, I applied on the basis of, hey, I'm in engineering. I work at RIM BlackBerry today. I do cool. I do pretty cool stuff, and I, I'd really like to move here. Geez, would that be okay? Um, and they said, yeah, sure, you can move in. Um, and in the first term, the director Jesse Rogers says, "Welcome to the residence. You don't have to do anything here, but what we expect is that you build something cool, not a business, not you don't have to make money. The, the, just show off to your friends, impress the other people in this room." with what you decide to build this term while you're at school or while you're on a work term. And our project back then, we called it Google Maps for the Indoors, uh, which was a side project for a long time until we got our first customer and then we got our first intern employee. Uh, and then I stopped going to school and I've been, I've been on it ever since. How did you get that idea? Pretty intuitive one. I think we literally sat around a table and said, what would we, what would we like to build this weekend? Um, Right, And it turns out that we were the third term of Velocity, that residence, the third group of people. The last two groups, somebody also had the same idea. It's a really <laughs> obvious one, map the indoors. And so if it's so obvious, what made you stand out? Stubbornness, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> um, Can you develop? Yeah. Elaborate, sorry. Sure. The, the obvious idea is is the experience of is the user interface the front end app of helping people find stuff indoors that's obvious um, once you start working on that though you realize what's actually missing is the maps themselves like what we take for granted is that there are maps today because google's made made it free and now apple's made it free but really satellites have made it free you can fly satellites over the earth you can drive cars down roads you can scrape the data um, whereas indoors it's all private 90% of the indoors, 99% is private. And it changes all the time. Um, you know, there's, we, my joke is like Santa Claus is in a different spot in the mall every year. Uh, but a, a, an office will have different seating. Uh, an airport will have gate changes every hour. The indoors is dynamic. And so the actual problem underneath it all was how do you somehow work with all the people who manage all the buildings? There's about 100 million of them in the world with different personalities, different use cases, different needs, um, different languages. Uh, and how do you get all of them to, to create digital maps the same way? So I think the intuition is that this is a B2C problem, but actually it's a B2B problem. Um, and that's, that's how my brain works, it turns out anyway. I, I'm, I'm good at those kinds of problems, I think. And, and it's taken a long time to get to where we are. It's been 12 years since I hack that thing in, in the residence, 11 since I dropped out of school. So stubbornness, I think, is what made us stand out. The thing that comes to mind when you say that is it, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily a technological solution then. It's more of a people one is convincing them. Like what you mentioned is it's convincing the people that this is worth it. And like these are different people. Like that that's not necessarily a technological solution that you bring then. Well, there's certainly technology. I don't want to discount all the work that the team does. But fundamentally, I think where um, where I leaned into the most early on was somebody has to sell this thing. And right. among the early founders, I was the least bad at talking to people. <laughs> so I became the CEO and I had to talk to people for a living. And that's really all I do now. Um, and so, yes, I, I think in B2B, it doesn't matter how good your product is. You, you, you have to convince people to use it. You have right. to listen to them in the first place because your assumptions about how they wanted to use the product are probably different um, than, than the reality. And you have to have empathy and intuition for the user. And the user writes a check. And, and sometimes the user has, in our opinion, bad ideas <laughs> for it. They think it should be pink. We really think it should be blue. But sometimes that customer is important enough. And so... And then there's employees and then there's investors. And so I, I think I think fundamentally this is always a people game. Um, but the stories that we tell about Apple, about Tesla, about the great companies today are are about the products because that's the most intuitive to each of us. It's also, I think, the most aspirational, right? Like the, the goal of 
Apple is not to build a giant company with all these people. The goal is to build great products. Um, but you, you need the people and you need the customers to buy them and you need the reporters to write about you and you need the, the store managers to carry your product. You need you know, suppliers all over the world to build it. Um, almost every business is really a people game. Uh, we just think of them as product outcomes. So how does a couple students in a residency convince uh, people working in malls or like you're saying it's these private areas. How does a bunch of student convince like private businesses that, yeah, yeah it's going to be worth buying this product? Well, to maybe make it more general, I think students have superpowers. Students can show up and ask outrageous things with naivety and people will give you some benefit of the doubt, right? Like we just, we, we were showing it to everybody. I was showing it to everybody. The other two weren't talking much, <laughs> but I would show it to like, Hey, here's a cool demo. We're building this. What do you think? Cause that was the goal, right? Show it off to people and impress them. That, that I think that's a very pure goal in the early days. Um, and eventually we met somebody who said, you know, I've, I've seen you kids walking around here for a while. It seems like you're pretty serious about this idea. How about this? I know the general manager of Conestoga mall, the local shopping center. I can get you 15 minutes with Sandra. She's pretty tough, but let's see what she thinks. So we got our 15 minutes. We actually had a video recording of the live demo because the live demo sometimes didn't work. So we had a video recording of it. We hit play and, and Sandra Stone, who ended up being our first customer and still a hero of mine, uh, said in that meeting, okay, I get this. You know, this is the digital version of the paper board that we have. And we like to be innovative here. Um, can you do this by Christmas? And it was September when we showed it to her. In my head, I thought, yes, we can, right? Like, it, we know how to build this. We can do this. Um, so yes, Sandra, we can. In fact, it has to be November, early November to, to get everything ready. Malls don't touch anything once you get to mid-November uh, and ready to prepare for Black Friday and Christmas. Um, so yes, we can. And then Sandra wrote the contract for us because we had no idea what a contract <laughs> looks like. Uh, and it was, you know, I made up the biggest number on the spot for how much it would cost, which is like the, the lowest price anyone's ever paid since. Um, and, and yeah, they're, they're our first customer. Sandra's now retired, um, but you know, her and I sometimes still run into each other, stay in touch. Right. So if I, if I were to like summarize that and maybe generalize, it's like you were doing this thing, kind of a lot of naivete until someone notices, like you keep showing up. Yeah. Just ask. Yeah. Exactly. It, I mean, and I think that's, that's, that's a first time naivety that I wouldn't have the next time, right? I would be so much more intentional. If I was to start a business today, first of all, I know people, uh, yeah. right? Like I can, I can very confidently reach out through people I know to other people that they know. And they, I want to talk to this person. Great. And I'd be very intentional and they would expect that, you know, I'm, I'm in my thirties now I've built a business. I, I, they would expect yeah. that I show up with an agenda with my shit together. Um, no one expects that of the kid that's in first year. It's, it's a superpower. Um, and, and I think people should use that to say, Hey, I, I'm just a student. I'm working really hard here. I'd love to show you what we're doing. Um, can I show it to you, please? You know, can, can, can you give me some feedback? Uh, I'd love to know what you think and who in the world is going to treat you badly when you do that. Um, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to do a bit of research and like background and, I found this is not your first time trying to sell stuff to people. No, no, I guess not. Well, uh, I, I think I know what you're referring to, but to more generalize it, every kid sells stuff. When they <laughs> convince their parents to buy like Frosted Flakes or Reese's Pieces instead mm -hmm. of like the healthy cereal, that's sales, right? Like it, there's, there's a bad, it's a bad word in, in our current society because you think of like the used car salesman that's tricking people, but really you're just convincing people um, and convincing people is is life um and every kid knows how to do it some are better than others but but yeah i uh in high school um really i guess what made me do all of this is boredom because uh, in high school we were bored as well my friends and i and we started a four funsies business where we would <laughs> import shoes online like the you know, really early days no one had heard of like the the overseas like the alibabas or stuff like we would just find online e-commerce merchants who would sell us hate to say it knockoff shoes uh, brand name um 
and we'd order to, we drew straws between the three of us, Simon's house. <laughs> so he would get boxes and boxes of these knockoff shoes and we'd sell it to our friends. Um, and it would be, you know, like Ottawa's where I grew up is a pretty safe community, but now and then we, we would, you know, you would end up going to this thing where you'd, you know, you're, somebody wants to buy some shoes and you know, that person's a little rough. Um, and then you just invite all your friends to have, come hang out with you on a bridge so that you can have safety numbers. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think I read like that went on until your parents were like, Hey, actually this is, this is not cool. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know what I would say if I had a kid and they were doing that. I was getting like a hundred boxes a week of knockoff shoes to my house. I'd probably say knock it off or maybe deep down I'd be like, yes, you know, they're hungry. Did you, that's, awesome. that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Like, did you feel yeah. like you, like, I mean, like it makes a cool story, right? But beyond yeah. that, like, do you feel like it was, it taught you something? In hindsight, it did. I don't know what I was learning then. It was just fun. It was just a fun story. Like we were bored. We had yeah. good grades in school, but that, you know, like that was just the baseline. Um, what could we do that was kind of fun? I think what it teaches you in hindsight though, and you don't realize it when you're in the water, what the waves look like. Um, but it teaches you that you can just do anything. You can just do stuff, right? I, I meet so many people today, including folks that mapped in that I, I try to shake now and then to say, look, I know there are rules, um, but if you can own the outcomes, if you can own the consequences, you can just do stuff in general. And, and if you have good intentions, right? Like don't, don't murder people. Um, <laughs> right. But, uh, but sometimes like if we think about how, if we think about how Uber came to be, um, they were, if you think about the early days of Uber, everyone was cheering for them. They were taking on taxi monopolies in every city. It was clearly against the rules. But if you look at what they were trying to do, it's like, hey, why can't I use an app to book someone else's car so that they can pick me up and I don't have to deal with the person whose machine isn't working? Like, well, that that's just, like, you can just do that. Um, and everything in the world that we take for granted, like this cup, like this, the, everything we use was made by people and like us. Uh, and, and, uh, all the systems that we live in that we think are broken are, were built and now maintained by people just like us and they can just do stuff too. So I, I think that's really what experiences like that teach you. Although I don't think I had made that realization back then. Do you find it hard to, as you become a parent <laughs> yeah, to keep on that, yet. uh, it, you know, on that analogy, do you find it harder to to do that? Like you were talking earlier about the, that the superpower basically being the the naivete and like not really knowing where the rules are, and so kind of just walking in the room and being like, "Hey, why can't I just do that?" And then you slowly realize, "Oh, there there are reasons. They might not be good reasons, but they are reasons why things happen." Like as you've now, you also have things to lose. As yeah. as the, you know, the company gets bigger. You have Absolutely. employees that depend on you know, having a paycheck at the end, do you find it harder to have that approach? It's certainly harder, right? And it, if for no other reason that there's a lot of people who now work with me and tell me no all day long. Um, his, his name is Jerry. He's my CFO. I love Jerry. All he does is say no. And, and him and I have these fun conversations. We've had them for years, like at, almost every week. I'm like, why can't we just do that? And then he'll be like, okay, well, here's why. And like most of the time they're Almost every time, they're really good reasons. Um, but then, you know, we we try to we I pick my battles. We pick our spots, right? Because right? Jerry and everyone else understands, like we're trying to do something that by default doesn't happen. That's what a startup is. If you don't do it by default, the world stays the same, and and it's it's a deeply anti-social thing, I think, to start a company. Unfortunately, because what you're saying is the world's wrong, society's wrong. If we assume that the markets are efficient, then every good idea is already being done. If you have an obvious idea in your head that is obviously going to make money, like why hasn't someone done that? So <laughs> the the ideas that you still have that are that remain, the ideas that remain are non non obvious ideas that are good, or obvious ideas that are actually bad, um, and obviously pick the former. Um, but by doing that, you're just betting that everyone else is wrong. Um, and 
how are they wrong? Well, they haven't had the good idea. They don't think it'll work. They don't think the technology is possible. They've made laws that prevent this sort of thing. In the case of Uber, um, there are conventions in our society that you know they don't have the imagination. All these things, and so I think you have to have that attitude. The question is, do you ever stop? Is there a point at which you 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 stop taking that because you get in your own way? Um, I haven't been through this journey once yet to make that call, so I don't know. Um, I think the big companies serve as a really great um, po- area of analysis, let's say, uh, right? Like at Apple, for example, Tim Cook, I think, is responsible for 90% plus of Apple's market cap. Like when Tim Cook took over, Apple's market capitalization was probably 10% of what it is today. So is Apple Tim Cook or is Apple Steve Jobs? And I think anyone in the world has an answer to that. Um, but it's, it's, an, it's objectively clear who built the majority of Apple's value. Um, and if you look at the products that Apple has today, since Jobs, probably the most innovative product is the AirPod that now everyone uses and everyone else is copying. But that's about it. Like Vision wasn't first. Right, Vision was just copying Oculus and trying to out-execute, which is what Apple does really well, out-executing. Um, so I think at some point you stop and you decide time to just grind it out and make money. But it seems to me like the longer you can wait, the greater the potential in the end. I want to I want to come back to that a little bit later because uh, I I like these these I feel like they seed little seeds for like later in the conversation. So I want to come back to indoor mapping. Sure. And I, I'm a guy who works with satellite images as well. Like that's where I'm familiar with. I understand satellite images. I understand how you make outdoor maps and how you can trace a trail or a road uh, from a satellite imagery and like update it over time, how autonomous cars with cameras can feed into that. Like I understand how you can make a map of the outside world. I don't understand how you make a map of the inside world, especially when all of those are owned by different people. And so I guess I have a very simple question that probably has a complicated 12 year yeah. long answer <laughs> yeah. to how do you map yeah. the indoor at a very high level? Yeah, um, at a very high level, we build upon the work done by others. We, we're we turning pieces of paper into digital records and then building tools that allow anybody to improve those records. Um, so, yeah, at a high level, we can we can talk about kind of the new stuff coming out since. But do you have an example maybe of, the, of yeah. what that looks like? Every building has a map, right? Um, some have eight, right? If you walk into a building, by law, there's a fire escape map posted somewhere. Someone made that. It's just a piece of paper now. It's mostly wrong. Right, it doesn't have enough detail to be useful for if you're looking to find an empty room somewhere or find Santa Claus. But it has the balls, it has the structure, it has the important stuff. Um, Let me interrupt and, you there. What do you mean by it's mostly wrong? It's out of date. It's okay. out of date, and it doesn't have enough detail to be useful at this point. So I, I guess wrong is not the right word. It serves a vital purpose as a fire safety map, um, but it doesn't serve a purpose as a general map at this point. Okay, and. So every building has that. Every building was built by an architect, assuming it's you know under <laughs> 200 years old. And I know in Europe that's not always the case. Um, so somebody built it, and when they built it, they had plans, and those plans are essentially maps. Um, so start with that. Start with the piece of paper. Digitize it as fast as you can in the most efficient way that you can, and then realize that since the building was built. Or the or the fire safety inspector drew that fire safety map. Things have changed, and the problem is the person who made that map in the beginning is long gone. Those were the experts, but what you have left are office managers, facility managers, marketing coordinators, um, cleaning people, produce managers at the grocery store. These are the people who are walking around the building every day, who are responsible for maintaining the building, and every now and then. They take that piece of paper and they print it out and they scribble on it with a pen um, to say, okay, well, I, I just need to know for me that this is wrong, this is right, here's, here's where things are. And they might 
scan that piece of paper in and email it to their boss to be like, by the way, this is what I just did, right? I'm the produce manager at uh, the local grocery store. We had too many cucumbers today. Here's where I put them. Just so you know, this is where they are now. And and eventually that PDF, let's say, um, gets re-digitized by an expert at head office or outsourced to an expert at a consulting firm using Photoshop or something like that into a new digital map. And that gets printed out next time. So that's that's the status quo of mapping indoors today. And what we realized early on at Mapped In is, well, A, we were we were the ones being sent those scribbles. And we just hated Photoshopping. It just seemed so inefficient. So being engineers, we thought, let's build a tool for ourselves. Let's build a tool that we would prefer to use because it's faster so that we can maintain a digital map without having to retrace and re-Photoshop every single time somebody sends us a scan. And that's really become the main tool today at Mapped In. Um, and here I will, without talking too much, I, I will point out that there's a difference between maps and models. Uh, maps are abstractions, right? It's models are real world. And, and all the time we get asked by folks, like, how do you make street view? It's like, wow, we don't, we don't make street view because you don't use street view in your car when you're navigating and driving from A to B, you use a map. Um, whereas a lot of folks I think are also trying to build 3D models of the world for autonomous driving and for things like that. Um, oh, I see and, what you mean. And that's, okay. that's an area we can go into as well. Yeah, so when you mean model, you mean like a, a 3D model, because I think of a map as like a model of the world. Correct. Uh, but yeah, so, okay, the the map is a simplified representation that serves a specific goal yes. of one piece of the world. And a model is doesn't necessarily have a, a goal, but it's just trying to represent things the most accurately. Is that, do I capture what you're getting at? Well, S semantically, yes, and maybe there are better words to choose, but maps and right. models is the, how I've had it, have it in my head. And you're making maps. We I've, make maps. So that we, means there's a specific goal in mind for those maps. Sometimes many. Right. Um, but I think the main uh, thesis of what is a map versus a model is a map is an abstraction. A map is a simplification that is meant to be a tool, not a... Um, faithful representation to the highest possible accuracy of the world around us. Um, it's a necessary compression as well, a map, um, because our, we can't we can't use point clouds of the streets to navigate as we drive. It's just too much data. Yeah, you don't always need to know what the color of the wall is Correct. for your map to be yeah. effective. Or the, the arrangement of the leaves on the tree. Yeah, 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 I see. Okay, so what is the, so you talked about the, like all the people that are working inside the building that basically aren't architects that need that map on a day-to-day. -day. So those are, I'm guessing, the users that you want to tailor to, to make it easier for them not to have to go through Photoshop and post-it yeah. notes of updates. Why, so how do you solve that problem for them? I'm like, basically the question I'm asking is like, what value are you offering? Because they still need to scan that map and send it to you and send the scribbles on it. We built a tool for them. I, I think of it as building, you know, pick your analogy, Google Docs for maps or Figma if you're a designer for maps. Okay, I see. Right? Um, before Google Docs, there was Office and before Figma, there was Photoshop. But both of those tools are now more popular because if for the every man, every person we call it, because they're easier. They're easier to use. They're right in the browser. You don't have to download anything. They're really simple. And UX, si simple is hard, right? They're really simple and they have multiplayer. Game changing. Like you and I can log in and we can type on the same document and we can collaborate in real time. So we've built all those things into mapped ins tools. Um, and the, the test will be, does the world really think they're simpler? Do, do people really believe that these are better products? than the ones they're used to using. One of the earliest moments of, well, like big milestones in the early days, we had just through sheer effort, uh, won some of the larger mall companies in Canada. This is maybe in 2013. And we cold called the world's large, largest mall owner, Simon Property Group. And we managed to get to Patrick Flanagan, the VP 
of digital there, took the call. Hey, Patrick, this is what this is mapped in. This is what we do. Here's how all the Canadian malls uh, are using us. And they maintain their own data. That's really our secret sauce is that, you know, your stuff changes so much, they just log in and change it themselves. And his answer was basically bullshit, show me. <laughs> um, and so we booked a demo that same afternoon. I showed him the demo uh, over whatever screen sharing we were using at the time. And that led to a contracting conversation because Patrick at his scale, understood this problem intuitively. He, 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 like he lives it, right? Most people in the world don't realize that that's the real problem uh, that we had to solve first with indoor mapping. But Patrick did because he had already solved it the slow way with Photoshop, with you know internal manual labor hours using bad tools. So once you use a bad tool, you know what a good one looks like. And um, and, and I think it's it's very satisfying for us. Like to some extent, I think making tools was a personal decision because until Patrick said that, no mall had asked us to build tools. They just wanted us to build apps. And that's what most people on the street think of when they think of indoor mapping and mapped in is, oh, that big touchscreen in the mall or the thing I use in the Super Bowl app or, you know, the thing at the airport. I get it. But for for me and for the early team at mapped in it felt deeply satisfying to build tools that we could use ourselves and we could imagine other people using as well um and and i'm glad that the world's starting to have more people like patrick who have used bad tools for mapping and can now see what a good one looks like so i guess if i understand correctly you realize that the the problem wasn't showing the data like in a mall or, or something. Because like, you know, again, I'm thinking malls, like I think everybody can visualize that map of, of a mall and like, okay, sure. I want to go to whatever store, where is it? And kind of tells you. But what you identified is the fact that that map is going to change a lot and often. And so you Correct. need not just to show it, but to be able to, like basically updating is part of the cycle. And it's not just a static thing, but it's something that, regularly needs to change and so rather than seeing it as a a bug that it changes like okay what does it look like if we rethink it from the ground up where this is a living document correct okay that's right and you know i i think we 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 exist today and thrive because of our partners who do want to build the front end solutions and many of them make way more money than we do uh, right, like there's there's currently a return to work cycle happening in the world, and when you're returning to a big office, you have to book meeting rooms now. You have to book desks. The the office layouts have all changed. So that category is called IWMS, Integrated Workplace Management Software, and we integrate with five of the biggest ones in the world now, about to be six, and they all charge more than we do. Like we're <laughs> we're a ten percent component at best right. in their solution, um, but but we. But they all choose to integrate mapped in instead of building it themselves because it's really hard to get indoor mapping tools and SDKs right. Just like it's hard to do the outdoors. But yeah. at, le at least with the outdoors, you have free data, right? Open street maps exist as a starting point. Worst case, you can fly your own satellites or just buy the imagery and run AI on it. Indoors, it's even harder. There is no starting source of truth and it changes so frequently. So I think those are the two... Um, key things that you have to accept before you can come up with an idea uh, and a model of how to map the indoors properly. The model that we've come up with, and maybe there's a better one out there someday, but it's we're never going to replace, and we don't need to automate everything. The, the buildings in the world are going to be run by people, and those people have jobs. And they're walking around all day trying to do their jobs, and they just have bad tools. They have clipboards and paper. They have ancient you know, computer-aided design tools or GIS tools, and good luck, not, not to mention they're incredibly expensive. And yet, in their lives every day, they use Gmail, they use Google Docs, they use Dropbox. Why, why isn't there a tool like that, that that anybody can use who's a professional running a building to, to maintain maps? Um, so that's, that's our goal, and we think that if we can enable all of those people to just be more, more productive, more effective, um, they already have the desire to do this yeah. and, and collectively we can map the indoors. This is really interesting. This is, I think one of the first times I'm actually thinking about what does it take to map indoors? 
Like I haven't really thought about it that much. There's there's just a few things that come to mind. I want to bounce back on when you said like we don't need to automate everything. Yeah. There's the like the, the data scientist in me is like ah oh, how dare you. <laughs> yep. And um, I so I want to I want to poke your brain a little bit more on that. Uh, kind of like maybe this is maybe there's two questions one I don't know but like what do you think is the do, do you think we can get to a point where we automate indoor mapping and uh, I'll expand on that a little bit like for a few years the iPhone has had lidar on mm-hmm. uh, some of the higher end iPhones the 3D point cloud reconstruction algorithms have gotten like ridiculously good really with good. things like Nerf and more recently those 3D Gaussian splatting stuff. If people have mm-hmm. never heard about that, I really recommend taking a look at that. And that is all with cameras, which more and more places have and people are carrying crazy cameras yes. in their pockets. Do you see a path to what Tesla is doing outdoors, for example, or some of these companies, which is like you map the outdoors with the, with the data that you collect, but indoors? Yeah, it's very tempting to imagine that future and never okay. say never. Uh, as Andy right. Grove said, only the paranoid survive. So we we think about this stuff a lot. Okay. Um, I, I can't resist the shout out to our uh, to the fact that we've released uh, an app called Mapped and Maker on the yeah. iOS store. If you have the, the LiDAR right? iPhones, give it a try. It's magic. So that works um, with the with the lidar as well. It does. Okay, yeah. cool. And and it 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 exports. It's free. It exports automatically into the rest of our annotation tools, and that's important because if if you think about the the complexity of the indoors, first of all, you have to you would have to access every single room of every single building. Remove the clutter, maybe even light it up if you're not purely LiDAR and you want textures and point clouds. Um, it, that's just not possible, right? It's private property. And, and even if you were to do that, let's, let's think about areas that you might map and why. Um, so, and there's so, it's, like it's, it's like an infinite tree almost immediately, but let's say it's an office environment um, and you want to map an office. Well, once you have the geometry, of the office, which is what you get with the, the LiDAR scanners. Um, what you need to know is who sits where, right? Where's where's Hongwei's desk? Uh, which offices have good uh, HDMI connections? Which ones can seat four people? Which ones can seat seven? Um, which ones are, you know, and that's that's like a simple one. Then you get to an airport and you need to understand, you know, what what is the routing logic of that airport, which is cannot be scanned. It's it's only, you know, it's it's explicitly decided by the airport authority that you can only go one way this way and one way the other way. This gate closes and this becomes international and this becomes domestic at certain times a day. Where where's my flight? That's the most important information. And you don't know that in advance. You can't scan that. So so outdoors, I think what Tesla's doing is quite brilliant and and I think intuitively easy to imagine it's just the scale that boggles the mind right every single Tesla is collecting free data that ultimately enhances Tesla's self-driving and their mapping suite um, but outdoors is a much smaller space of data parameters there's roads lines trees sidewalks I know lights, a lot like, of people who would disagree push back I, I know and and I, I'm sorry to say that but indoors is so much harder guys there are no streets. We don't yeah. even care about compass directions. Like it's it's anything goes. And and the things that keep people care about indoors might be behind the walls. Like I yeah. want to know where where the gas shut off is and that's buried behind a closet on the wall. I want to know where all the sprinkler valves and main connections are installed which is behind the drywall. Um I see. these are not things that you can just scan. It's it's part of a living data model that people have to maintain and it's in people's heads most of the time. So the back to you know I I think in terms of data, the the way I I model this in my in my head or map it to use the analogy we talked about, and I'm curious to know what you <laughs> think is. Yeah, we're, we're talking about if we if we if we were to build a very 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 basic uh, data model of the world, we have the geometries, and then mm-hmm. each of those have there are either lines or their points, and then they yeah. have features, and so. Uh, what I'm hearing is outdoors, those features are, is it a road? 
Is it blocked or not? Can I drive on it? And though there are things where you can automate that feature, like filling in those rows, like, is it a road? Yes or no? Like yeah. you can see it in an image. And so it's a lot easier to fill those features in those rows in. I'm thinking about like a you know a database in my head. Sure. It's a lot easier to do that outdoors and then indoors the things that you care about those rows are like which rooms have the fastest Wi-Fi, where are the HDMI cables, like the things that people care about, you can't fill in those rows with scans or like easily automate it. Is yes. that does that capture it well? That it it does. And and I think, you know, the computer okay. science answer is with enough data, you probably could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where I'm going next. <laughs> um, so but but I think that's that's where outdoors, getting the geometry outdoors, you can get enough data because you just have to build the world's largest company that with uh, electric cars that have cameras, like easy peasy. Yeah, I'm kidding, sure. of course, but it's it's like it's like conceptually simple. Um, whereas indoors, it's like, well, how are you going to get access to the building across the street, any building, and yeah. and convince them to give you access to scan the whole thing? I think my mind goes to Apple has or Google like have such they own the hardware that people have in yeah. their in their pocket. So let's not even think about privacy just for the sake of argument right now. <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> but I want to get onto that because that becomes like a very interesting thing. But yeah. I'm this is maybe like pure speculation, but I'm guessing like, oh, you could like you know where people are, and we're kind of getting to a point where we can do these like Wi-Fi signal mapping of it in like you can kind of figure out where someone is in a room based on like how much like Wi-Fi strength there is and Bluetooth strength there is. And then you could maybe like get a, you know, speed reading of like how long did it take to receive all those packets? This is like talking way outside of the things I'm comfortable with, but I'm like sure. the nerd and engineer in me is like, there's gotta be a way to like yeah. map these things. It becomes a privacy nightmare. Um, but I, I get your point. Like we could probably go on forever on that, that like, okay, it is actually very hard to pull those things off. Um, well, do you, I'm sure you've heard of the, the joke and I, I'm also pretty sure this joke isn't true, but you know how, like they say that NASA spent like a bazillion dollars to invent a pen that, oh, yeah. uh, right. The ballpoint pen and that then works the Russians in zero brought, gravity. Yeah. And then the Russians brought a pencil. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm sure. I'm actually guessing that's not true, but um, if anything, it's cool that yeah. we we had the money to like spend. Like engineer, we, yeah, like that's cool. I'm I'm for that. Um, but I think the practical thing is that if we, the way I see it, there's a hundred million users in the world, potential users today, people that are scribbling on pieces of paper. Yeah, and I can make their life easier today. And I I am if we are. If we are caught blindsided by tech that automates what we do further, um, shame on us, right? But I think our commitment to our user base is we're going to be ahead. We will, we will be a trusted partner to you. We will look at what's real and what's... We, we will recommend to you what we think is ready and correct. Um, and we might be wrong and then you won't buy our stuff, but we're not going to bring you the latest science project and have you waste your money. Yeah. Because uh, you don't have enough, right? Like the, the, when we work with fire departments, for example, which is a recent project that we started working with thanks to Homeland Security in the States, they're, they're pretty straight with us. Like, look, there's, there's trucks, there's salaries, there's pensions, and then there's like this. Guess what I'm going to spend my money on, uh, right? It, it's the budgets are tight. And yeah. they're not waiting for tomorrow. They're running into the buildings today. So what is, what is the practical solution that we can deliver today? And when the earn the trust of all of these people that then fund our innovation for tomorrow. So, you know, the, the, the maker product that we're releasing right now, which is both uh, like a, a web-based tool that has computer vision automation for whatever map you upload, but also the iOS 
app that lets you scan a room using the LiDAR tech, it's it's like magic, right? And no one asked us to do that. It's been a huge investment by Mapped in. Um, well, the US government did, but that was for <laughs> public safety. But it's still been a huge investment outside of that to package it for the every person. And when we show that to our current customers, we usually say, hey, one more thing at the end of the meeting. Let me show you this new thing. And we show it to them and we're like, look, this is obviously not ready for you because what you need is way more complex. But they always go, that's amazing. I love that you guys are doing this. We, we want to work with people who are innovating. Clearly, that's you. Um, very cool. And then they never think about it again because it's not, <laughs> it's not really what they need right now. And I think most people don't need that. They just want to know that you know, everyone's busy. They just want to know it's coming. They want to know that there's people who are going to tell them when it's ready um, and, and explain to them. Uh, and, and so that, you know, they're smart enough to engage on the practicalities of it. No one needs to know how the ballpoint pen works. They just need to know that it, it works. It yeah, writes. It writes. So I, okay. I, I want to leave the, I want to come back a little bit later to the, the bigger tech companies, but let's, let's go a little bit on that app. The first thing that comes to mind is if it's, if it's free, it means you're not directly making money on the, the sale of it. So what is the rationale for making an app like that now it's also on ios so it's you know a much larger potential crowd of people not just the the office manager um what's the what's the rationale for investing some some time and effort into making something like that perhaps it's irrational at the in the at the end of the day um, <laughs> so how did you convince I, the cfo i guess is the question that, <laughs> that took a lot uh <laughs> believe me um and it wasn't just me so I think we wanted to show the world what we can do. Um, like I said, mapped in and our business, and I think most B2B businesses, but probably just most businesses, is a people game as much as it is a product game. Um, we've always built the best products, right? Like I could go to name any building that could be mapped in, and I, I can, I'm pretty confident that if we compare the products that we have today with what their team's currently using for the equivalent purpose, it's like, we're already better. But most of the time, I can't. I can't just will. I can't change their minds, right? You can't force people to change their minds. They have all sorts of reasons um, why they're doing things a certain way. Most of it's inertia, and I understand it. Like if you and I look at our morning routine, just to bring it back to basics, how much of that could be improved? But we choose not to because it's just like it's not broken. Like I could have slightly better coffee, but my, I like my coffee. My mug's kind of chipped, but I kind of like it. Um, you know, my bed's a little uncomfortable, but I'm used to it now. So I think most people, they optimize certain parts of their day and they lock it in so that they can do new things. And we're asking, we're going out in the world and asking people to change. Um, and, and that's hard, especially if they have a job and it's, it's their, you know, it's what they do at work. So Maker is intended to, in five minutes or less, show people there's a better way to do this. It's a high bar. Hopefully, we'll succeed. So it's really reducing the friction of the like decision making or like showing that instead of having like I'm gonna need half an hour of your time, it's like I'm yeah. gonna need five minutes of your time. Don't even talk to me. Just try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then talk to me because you want to know how it, how we did it, how we pulled it off. Yeah. And, and well, now you have a different have. problem, which is like you need to convince people to try it. Yes. But, Yes, it's a totally different problem. It's actually a totally different company. Is is the uh, yeah the scary thing about all this, right? We've been internally we call it PLG product led growth, and we started out as a traditional SLG company, sales led growth, because it ha we had to be like our our customers. Can you, are sorry, these... could you let me interrupt you? Could you develop a little bit what those are? Yeah, sure. Um, so PLG, I think, mostly applies to B two B companies because if you're B two C, you're almost always product led. Um, but in B2B, the traditional way of thinking about how to grow your company is you build a product and then you build a sales team and the sales team goes and sells it and you have contracts. And inevitably, um, or what seems to be gravity in that world is eventually your product gets more and more complicated and it gets more and more heavy and bloated. And because of every big customer shows up and says, 90% of that's good, but add 10 for me. Yeah, I see. So you, you cater to the sales that you make rather than saying, I have this product, I have this app, this website, whatever. It's leave yeah. it or take it. Here's the sign up to pay. Correct. Okay. And, 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 you know, I would say slightly more nuanced, right? Because yeah. 
most people will just leave it. They're like, all right, screw you, kid. <laughs> like I, I got my enterprise tool. Like you're, you're dumb. Um, this is, this is why you're poor basically. Like <laughs> that's, that's how people are going to think about this. So you have to still convince people. You just have to be so thoughtful about how your product convinces them. Um, right. and, and I think even in PLG, and this is what we, we've debated so much internally, it doesn't really mean don't think about the people. It just means you don't have to talk to them, but it's so much harder because you have to communicate through everything else we're doing indirectly. Um, and you probably still have to talk to a lot of people. Like I'm, I'm talking to you right now about what we're doing, which should be self-evident. And yet we still need to get the word out. We still need to convince the influencers in the world. Um, and one person at a time, my mom, your mom, like I'll convince anyone on the street I see, you got to try and make her for five minutes, just see what happens. Um, and of course, it's not the iPod, so not everyone cares. Uh, but I think most people who manage buildings will at least have some intuition for this problem. Anyone whose house is flooded and has had to draw a, a map of their house to send to the insurance company understands this problem. And we've taken a five-hour job and turned it into five minutes. So hopefully, over time, enough people are going to try stuff with Maker. Uh, it's been just amazing to see what people are already building inside it it surprised us frankly how individuals are willing to invest sometimes up to an hour once they realize oh wow this does work okay how do i how do i perfect it right and how do i make all the changes how do i actually create a map that i can put on my website and publish it which someone did in an hour uh and that's that that was that was a cool moment for us so I, but get, getting back to your earlier point about PLG versus SLG, we're we're so used to at Mapped In because of the the state of the world. Like when we started Mapped In back in 2011, 2012, no one is ready. No one was looking for a free tool on the internet to make indoor maps. Like no one, no one. We we could have launched Maker then, and no one would have cared. Um, and so the only way to grow Mapped In in the early years was SLG, sales led growth. We go to the big companies that have a solution problem. Not just a mapping problem, but I want wayfinding for my mall. I want desk booking for my office. I want analytics for my warehouse. And we built the entire solution, which packaged in our core mapping tech. And over time, the pressures of that requires you to build a pro tool, a pro suite. And the product gets more and more complicated. And it is, I had this debate probably every single week for 10 hours with my co-founder who has since burned out from that debate. Um, having that debate over pure versus like get the deal, right? And and I think that tension actually kept us a bit honest because our product, if you look at it, our pro products today are still a lot more simple than the enterprise desktop products that you could use otherwise. Um, but it's trending that way. It always does. And and I, I would make the observation that you know if you think about most of the software companies in the world. Most of them are, are enterprise. We just we tend to tell the stories about Google and Apple, but I think more software engineers work collectively at Salesforce and yeah. you know in SAP. Um, so it trends that way, and and PLG is this new new trend, if you will. But it's an, it's the realization that the end user is starting to win. Um, Ten years ago, in the big corporate office, it didn't matter if you as a individual wanted to use an iPhone when the boss said, we're a BlackBerry shop. Or if you wanted to use Google Docs, but the CIO picked Microsoft Office. Today, it's hard to hold that back, right? Collectively, employees of the world said, I'm bringing my iPhone to work, make it work, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And that's how the iPhone replaced Blackberries everywhere. And I live in Blackberry town, it's real sad, we still think about it. Um, and, and same thing for Google Docs, same thing for Gmail over Outlook, same thing for Dropbox over the file server. So the individuals and their tastes and their preferences are starting to matter more, even at work, because all of us are computer savvy now, not just the IT people. Um, and we get to make decisions. We should be the ones making decisions, we're the ones doing the work. And and so if we can get to those people and show them, here's here's what we built, might be better than what you're using. Give it a try. It's free. And if you really like it, there's obviously a paid version that does even more. Um, that's 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 just a bet. And I hope it works. 
Um, if nothing else, I think we're really proud of what we put out so far. Our, our core business is obviously very strong, selling the pro tools to our enterprise customers. That continues to go well. Uh, but again, a lot of those enterprise customers, when we show them Maker, we get, we were giving them a heads up that, hey, by the way, this is about to come out. It's going to be free. It's different than what you have. It doesn't do what you currently need, but it's pretty cool. Let me just show it to you for five minutes. They're all really excited about it because they they get how in the long term, building for the end user creates a better product. And that helps them too. The, the first thing I'm thinking is uh, it's probably, like I'm curious to understand or hear a bit more about how you made that pivot. Because I think if you have some sales team that says, hey, we've got this $10 million contract. We just need to add these three yeah. features. Then what I'm hearing is you have to have maybe the discipline or whatever you insert, whatever adjective yeah. to say, no, we're not going to do that because that's going to creep up over time. We're going to ch pivot down the line to, to something else. And, uh, you know, companies need money to stay afloat. <laughs> So how do you how do you make yeah. that pivot just from a you know from a finance point of view from like this company needs to survive point of view? Well, it was obviously it was tough. I, I think in my case, it helps that I was the guy selling. Right, I was the guy bringing in the money anyway. So it's like it's not just my money. We have a lot of shareholders um, who invested in in us and and took a bet sometimes in me. Um, but it, it took me a long time to realize I'm willing to bet on myself, right? I, I don't know. I'm not the world's expert in anything, but in indoor maps, I probably know more than most people. And in terms of how to run mapped in, I think I might actually be the smartest person in the room most of the time, right? Um, and, and like our team internally is incredibly collaborative. This was something that I think all of us felt the pull of. This is the next step of the CMS, the, the self-serve tool that Simon bought. This is the next step, the self-serve tool that anyone could buy. And it was just such an intuitive idea, but the business case didn't make it obvious that that's the next thing we should do. And at some point last year, or was it, yeah, it was last year, I said to the team, hey, we're doing this. Like, leave the other details to me. We're carving out eight people. We're gonna not distract you guys. Just go. Right. Go so make it's it having that, convic that yeah. conviction. Yeah. Conviction that this is the direction you need to go. And, and to our earlier point, like eventually, I need to stop doing this stuff, right? Eventually, eventually, the way to build bigger is to optimize. Um, but I think the longer we can wait, and I'm hopeful that the longer we wait, the longer that we're willing to be foolish and take chances and, and try new things, um, the the greater the potential of the business. And certainly I think the potential of Mapton is much bigger today because we're saying we're willing to go for the really big outcome, um, which is mapping actually all actually mapping all the indoors by enabling all of the people that work indoors. Yeah. As opposed to a $10 million, $1 million, $100,000 contract that increments us forward with a specific enterprise in a specific vertical, which we know how to do. So but to go back to your earlier point, if, if those were my two choices, a $10 million contract or make this maker bet, I'm like, well, I, uh, my, I choose both. <laughs> That's, uh, I had an investor uh, early on say, because you know, every now and then you feel bad for yourself and you go, oh, why is this so hard? Why am I working so hard? And he just says, well, it's double time all the time. Uh, and sometimes that's just the case and and you choose right i our team that's been working on maker has been working double time for the last three months and before that they've been working harder than anyone else anyway and i haven't said to them once as a team i said to the manager of the team once but as a team i didn't say you need to do this it was just okay we've carved this out we we all agreed that this was the goal we only have so much time to do it because the company's funding all of this so here's the date. Good luck. Um, and the fallback is whatever you guys build, we'll be able to use it, right? Like the tech is amazing. Um, so we can always sell that back to our enterprise customers, but we have a finite amount of time that I'm willing to carve out and, and give cover from investors, from the board, from people who ask very reasonable questions like, why are we doing this? Um, to, to really give this a try, to bet on ourselves. Go for it. And 
And I think it's the same feeling as when you get a group of people, high, like high performing people anywhere, is if you give them a mission that's that is meaningful to them and is truly hard, you don't have to tell them how hard to work. They just get excited about doing it anyway. And and it's it's deeply rewarding just to even see things come together. And it's not for everybody. Um, but it's it's been it's been like really inspiring even for me. Like I'd I probably get the most inspiration every day just from my own colleagues. Uh, it's it's one of the main reasons I still do this, I would say. Um, you know, growing the business. Like if the goal was just to make money, uh, there's so many ways to do that, it turns out. Like real estate's real simple and and you work like a day a week uh, instead of like twelve. So uh, but this is more fun and and we get to build something that touches all these different people and people get to give it a try. So um it also helps that we had board members join recently, uh, and and shout out to them. It helps a lot that you know James Killick, who was a leading Maps product owner, all the way from ETAC through MapQuest through Navtech through Esri through Apple. Like this guy's been doing it for thirty years. His partner in crime, Michael Nappy, uh, who was VP of Business at MapQuest, and then went all the way most recently to the head of indoor uh, indoors and commerce at Here. Like these two people showed up and said, "Yep, this all makes sense. Go." And that you know that makes me really. You think so? Like you think this is smart? We're terrified. <laughs> okay, all right, let's let's go for it. Um, and that that was that was pretty cool. And and them showing up at the board, I think, also uh, gave the same kind of comfort but cover to a lot of the folks who are very smart financially but don't have the same intuition intuitions that they do about the market and about the product. Um, and, and again, like it, to circle back, it, it took me a long time to realize that I have those intuitions too and to really believe that. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. think we all have some self-doubt in our minds with this stuff. Um, unless, you're, unless you're Kanye West. Um, <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I say jokingly that it must be nice to have Kanye West energy, to just think you're always right all the time. And, and it's clearly gas for the guy, until it's not, until, until you go yeah. too far. Um, but you can see how, I, it's, it's, a, it's like a provocative observation how so many of the people who we all know really well just are somewhat irrational about, about their own reality. And, and I, I think you need a bit of that. You need to believe more than others do. You said earlier that only the paranoid survive. I, I, I don't know, that quote was like an interesting one. And I feel yeah. like it kind of goes on to like feed on, on what you just talked about. Like, are you worried about like these giant mega co companies like Google or Apple uh, getting into the some of the indoor mapping as well? Like you were talking about James Keeley, like, I had him on the podcast recently. He was working on indoor mapping yeah. at Apple uh, for maps. And he was working on some of the airport. Like I was in the US not so, like just a, a month or two ago. And some of the indoor maps of the airports, uh, I was in Denver. And the the on Apple Maps, the map of Denver is like, really cool, the airport, I mean. And Absolutely. that is an indoor uh, map. So you can tell, okay, here's where everything is they have this like really cool 3d model um are you is that something that you think about are you on the paranoid side of that i'm just really curious to know what, yeah. what you think of that i i worry about everything it's <laughs> my go-to line everything um yeah i with apple and google someday i think we'll be able to tell the full story of mapped in an apple because obviously james is on our board mm -hmm. I can call Apple, you know, people we work with. I, I, I'm careful to choose my words there. Um, but I think the business model of Apple and the business model of Google is different than the business model yep. of mapped in. That's how I always think about it. Apple's goal is to sell phones. Google's goal is to sell ads. Um, it just so happens that they've both decided having a good outdoor mapping application is a good way to sell, a differentiated outdoor mapping application is a good way to sell phones and ads. Um, Mapped In's goal is to sell map making tools to op to property managers. The output of those tools is actually useful to Google and Apple because when they try to map the stadium or when they ask the airport, please send us what you have, they wish it was good. 
it's mostly not good. It's the stuff yeah. we get it scribbles on paper, but if it was already good, well, that makes our life easier. Um, so we're in completely different lanes. We don't compete with Apple and Google on, on business model. And I think when everyone realizes that when our goal is simply to enable the, the facility, the venue to create and maintain digital maps, and we offer them tools that anybody can use. Uh, well, that's great. It's, it's also a, I don't think it's a small problem, but surely Apple thinks that that's a small problem, <laughs> right? Um, it's a big enough problem for us. It's hard. Uh, but I, I think there's that reality as well, that when people worry about, is the big giant company going to come for me? Well, like theoretically, yes, but I don't think people appreciate how much they struggle with focus as well. Yeah, I see. I, I can't imagine what it's like to run a hundred thousand person company versus a hundred person company because there are all we're already hitting the limit where I don't know everything. I, I really just trust the team that we we you know everyone's doing what they need to and making decisions at the at the edge of the organization instead of coming back to the center. It makes us fast, um, but I think that breaks once you get to a, even a thousand people. Um, so what I've realized having worked now with so many of these large companies is they do a couple of things really well. They try just about everything because they have brilliant people working there. But when it when it really comes down to it, focus matters. And and if you pick, in the, or in our case, almost by accident, uh, the lanes that are never going to be big enough. Like Google's famous for shutting down projects because it doesn't make a billion dollars after one year. <laughs> well, that's that's okay. That's actually good for me. Yeah, um, and it's good for a lot of people. I guess. Uh... You know, to to push back on that a little bit, um, I totally hear you on the the fact that like the crumbs for these companies are like hundred million dollar deals uh, or like industries or things like that. Um, I'm just thinking about like the direction that maybe more Apple is taking than than Google with sure uh, AR and yes. VR, which is like really bringing in. Back to the model and map, I think more on the model side, but it really Absolutely. is of the indoor. Yep. That's maybe different because it's people's private homes for now. Um, and that doesn't seem to be what you're were working on. But I really see that as like, okay, they're really going in that direction. And so I'm, I'm guessing like it seems like it might start inter-overlapping. Certainly there's overlap. And uh, I think you, hopefully, uh, hopefully the people see that we're, we're leaning into it. Like yeah. we have a free maker app that uses this, yeah, yeah. right? Because our, our fundamental bet, and I'm still willing to make it today, obviously, is that the, the metadata matters, the, the annotations, the yeah. attributes, right. whatever Back we're to using. what like, we were talking about. Yeah, you can't, that you matters can't. even more. Um, and, and what's easier at scale? So let's say, let's say you wanted to maintain a map of the office to come, keep coming back to that example, or your house. Um, but the office, I think, is a better one because it changes. It changes all the time, right? Like pods of desks get moved all the time. You you add stuff, you move stuff. What's easier, rescanning the whole office by walking around or logging in and dragging a desk over, um, right? Because if you, if you rescan the whole thing, you have to relabel everything. You have to re-clean up everything. And we can imagine a future where we trend towards perfect, like just AI that is smarter than we can possibly imagine, which is like imaginable actually because of how fast it's moving. Um, but you like, it's hard to imagine it actually getting easier than just logging in and dragging something. I see. Yeah. It's currently impossible for me to imagine that it gets cheaper because of how expensive compute is. That That's, that's like a new like law of physics at this point in, in, in tech, right? Like, so for now anyway, um, so I think there's, you know, pick anything, like pretty much any technology that exists today is obsolete inevitably. That's just the rule. So <laughs> that's a good one. And, and what we're really building at mapped in is a company of people who understand our users and who can build stuff. Um, and, and a community of users who buy our stuff and tell us what they want next. And 
and have similar problems and similar needs. And that's, I think, the most valuable part of Mapped In um, and always will be. So I want to shift gears a little bit. And what, one of the things I noticed when I've, I've heard previous interviews you've given, I've read some of the things you've written and just hearing you today, I get the impression, and I'm curious to hear what you think, that um, I think it, it seems like you take a lot of pride in the in the hard work that you put in and that the people around you put in like i'm getting a sense that like hard work is a value that you hold very strongly we need to snapshot that statement play it over for my parents who think i'm a slacker over and over (laughs) and over uh they 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 gave me so much shit when i dropped out of school yeah i i think that's there's like no you can get lucky but aside from that you can't really skip the work I think. Um, Paul Graham, who's one of my, uh, I've never met the guy, but um, read all his stuff. Uh, he calls it the conservation of pain rule. Um, you can you can be a postal worker for 40 years and make a million dollars that way over 40 years, or you can be a software you know, SaaS founder and try to make it in five, but you got to endure the same amount of pain concentrated to five. Mm. Um, and if you, if you set that expectation, if you if that's your baseline, you just hope to get lucky, right? But but the default is you're still going as far. You're just running faster. What it's it seems like it touched on something there with your uh, with your parents. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you want to go there, and you can tell me like no, but like I'm I'm very curious as well on that because if I I just read through like a, a lot of the things that you've done and you've done a lot of stuff, but I think it's a little bit different from the trajectory that some of your family was expecting. Sure. Well, I don't think there's, um, first of all, I, you know, love my folks, love my family. I think they're, you know, quite supportive of what I'm doing. Uh, not always. Um, and I understand, right? Uh, I, I actually have a lot of empathy for that because I don't know if I could be any better to watch. Like if, if you work that hard. So first of all, there's, there's probably no one. I will never be as hardworking as my mom. Like it, it's like an unattainable bar. Uh, like that. Th- she's uh, my entire family are doctors who married engineers. All the women are doctors. All the men are engineers. All the women tell the men what to do. That's my whole family. Um, like the doctors are like senior people. The engineers are just like smart and work hard. Um, and and then uh, I. When I was growing up, I was largely raised by my grandparents because uh, my dad was starting a business in China and my mom was overseas actually on a research assignment in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Didn't know it at the time, but she was trying to immigrate. And I can't imagine how hard that would be, go into a language that, where you go into a place where you don't speak the language. Um, And and then eventually convinced my dad, who had actually a pretty successful business, like 40, 50 people at that point, it later went public, but that was long after we left and didn't see any of that. Um, but convinced him to move to the US with me. And uh, by then, I, you know, I, I was like a spoiled kid, right? Raised by four grandparents. I went to board in kindergarten, but I hardly noticed because everyone else was in the board in kindergarten. But once we moved to the States, it was uh, like, we, first we couldn't stay. We couldn't get a, a green card. So we packed it up and drove to Canada. But um, for, for the first couple of years, like there was no one, right? It was get home at three, lock the door, do whatever you want, cook the rice at four. Um, <laughs> Which, which, by the way, I th- I'm pretty sure that's illegal, but uh, they did their best because uh, you need babysitters and stuff like that. But during that time, like you know, my parents were grinding it out. They, my mom got her PhD. She couldn't be a doctor; you'd have to recertify. It's too hard. So she ended up getting her PhD while working full time. And I don't think I could do that today. Like, screw that. Um, so I don't think I'll ever <laughs> work as hard as they do. But I'd like to think that I'm 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 leveraging my time better. Um, Right, I, and and I think that applies to so many of the heroes in my family who, I think a lot of my values come from. Um, but there's a there's an unfortunate mentality, I suppose, in almost every culture, but certainly in uh, in Asian cultures, it, the tall poppy syndrome, uh, where the tallest blade of grass gets cut, 
don't be that person. Just fit in, do what everyone else does, just outwork them. Um, and you know, if, if just be a better doctor, be a better engineer, outwork the pe people, get better, score better on the test. Well, it turns out the way to have the most amount of impact and I think fulfillment and also, you know, reward in life is to just play a different game, um, invent your own, do make, build stuff that people want that they didn't, they didn't know they wanted yet. Um, or something else like that. And, and most of that involves people, right? It, fundamentally, it's a people game. It's, you can't do anything meaningful without collecting a bunch of people and convincing them to do stuff and then finding a bunch of people to buy your stuff, basically. Um, so I, I don't think anyone in my family would tell me that I'm not working hard at this point. I, I truly think I am. I think I work a little bit harder every year, if anything. Um, but in, in the early days, it, it, it certainly felt like a shortcut that I was taking at mapped it by, by doing mapped in, right? My, so, sorry, to my, them or to you? To them. Okay. To them. Um, you know, cause my, my grandparents on my mom's side, they were rural farmers who taught themselves enough education to become math teachers. So let's say they had an undergrad and then, you know, my parents both had their masters when they left China. My, my dad was actually one of the few people that got sent on a like a national scholarship to go to England and get his master's at Bath University. Um, so they were like top of their class the whole way, outworked everybody, outsmarted everybody. Um, and and their goal for me was just get a PhD, basically, right? Just grind it out harder in the same lane. And and you and I know today that if your goal is financial outcomes, that's probably not the path, right? If your goal is to do fundamental research and like win the Nobel Prize, that's probably it. Right, I'm not smart enough to invent physics, which is why I worked on maths. Uh, right, I would I would love to have, you know, worked on foundational physics. Like who who wouldn't in engineering? Um, but we're all applied people at the end of the day, and we we found that that was our calling. Um, so I, I would say in the early days, it certainly felt like I was taking a shortcut by going straight into the workplace. Did you find that? hard to because i feel like you're now not only starting a company like you were also really really young when you started mapped in like you're a student yeah. like you know we talked about the naivete but then you're also going outside of the lane that the people around you expected you to to go on sure I, of course it's hard i don't think it's harder than some of the stuff other people have done like i i think nothing in my life is I can't imagine as hard as living in an emerging developing country and living hand to mouth. And I, I just don't think so. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think what we're doing is that hard on, on like human scale or being a caveman, you know, <laughs> or like a hunter gatherer. That seems really hard. Um, and, and, uh, when I get really bummed out sometimes, uh, we're just like, I'm having a hard day. Sometimes I'll just, uh, I'll call, I'll, I'll, I still call my paternal grandmother who like him, her and her, my grandfather were the ones who really raised me in my early childhood years. Um, and she fought a war, man. She's a hundred this year. She fought world war two. And, and she told me afterwards when the war was over, she went with the army back to what is now my hometown, Nanjing. And when she was a nurse, a medic at the hospital, she would sleep in a cardboard stall with a tin roof, no door and blankets because the whole city was burnt to the ground. It's probably like Ukraine today. And I, and, but she goes, oh, you know, but your life's harder today, Hongwei, cause, uh, cause that's all I knew. Everyone I knew in the world was right there with me, right next door. And we had a good time, you know, when the, when the hot soup showed up, it tasted really good. Whereas you kids today, you have Instagram, you have TV, like you can always, like there's, there's so much more that you compare yourself to. And it, it's much harder actually for, for mm. you guys today. And like, anyway, shout out to grandma cause that's deep stuff. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine it's probably brings perspective. Yeah, yeah, and and I I think it also makes you, um, it, like you got to pick what you want to do in life. I, I guess um, I had a I had a pretty crazy year last year, uh, work and personal and all these things. And I started asking myself, you know, in the medium term, would I rather be useful or happy? Uh, and which is like a 
really sad thing to ask. It sounds weird. Oh, but dude, what I, I meant was... No, please. <laughs> you get it, right? Yeah, because like, you know, because like my work sometimes stresses me out. It can't, it's impossible for it not to be. It's impossible for, for doing anything hard to not be tiring. Um, and and there are moments in the in that journey where you think like, well, I could just be happier if I just like didn't choose to do this. Like, I, you know, so many other things you could do that just p- pays well enough. Um, but But what's the point? I guess if if you know what's possible, if you know what can be done, if you have the responsibility, um, I think being useful in itself is meaningful. Um, I'm envious of the people I know who are quite religious, uh, who have built into them a purpose in life that is largely aligned to the way our societies want them to operate anyway. It's, it's great. Um, and maybe that's like a, like a, from my perspective, like a defining characteristic of the evolution of religions that have survived. Um, but like, that must be nice, you know, to think that everything has, is, uh, like you're here for a reason. There's a person looking out for you. He loves you no matter what, just do your thing. And here's the things you should do. And society loves those things anyway. Um, I think for, for, for me and maybe for the rest of us, you kind of have to pick like what, if if you have the options that we do and the privileges that we do, um, what's the point? And what are you trying to do? And and I I my answer to myself is well, I'd rather be useful um, in the medium term. And then if you choose that, it's like well, how useful can I be? How useful should I be? As as useful as possible. Uh, and then I and then uh, and then I did I signed up for a little too much last year. So I'm starting to cut back. Like I'd, I've been volunteering on a hospital board um, and learning a lot about our healthcare system here in Canada. Uh, I've been basically volunteering on, on a government agency to have better IP, IP policy in Canada. Um, at some point, I'd like to sign up for something called Big Brother, Big Sister because I never had siblings growing up. I was an only child. So like, it seems like something me- really meaningful to improve someone, one individual's life. Uh, but I, I don't think I... I'm glad I didn't do that. I wouldn't have time today. I, I like that. First of all, again, really appreciate you sharing that. I'm curious. This is something I've thought about a lot. I haven't started a company or anything, but I, I really like that frame of, of thinking. And one of the, I also don't have children, maybe one day, but one of the things I hear is that um, for a lot of young parents, like life becomes a lot less happy, but a lot more meaningful in the early years. Yeah. And I'm thinking back to what you were sharing as well of your your mom who was trying to go to Canada and, you know, working. I think you said she got a master's, like a PhD as well. Um, she got her PhD in Canada okay. after she immigrated. But like learning a new language and Mandarin and English are definitely not similar. Like it's a whole other thing. Like that's probably it's miserable, but... Yeah. Especially yeah. if you're there, that's that's probably incredibly meaningful. And like that, I, I think this, there's a lot of people who haven't been very happy, but I look back at my own family. My On my father's side, grandparents were farmers as well. And a lot of it is like grinding because of the people that come after you, like you want them to have a better life. And it does make you happy, but it gives you a lot of meaning. And Absolutely. I think. I, uh, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm I'm sorry to cut in, but no, 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 I, I, it sounds a bit arrogant to say, but I can't imagine it any other way now. I I can't imagine feeling satisfied or content content if I didn't have some some of the things that you just talked about. That feeling of this is what I'm this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm working towards. Um, I think I could be perfectly happy for like two months. Um, Maybe even a year, depending. It depends on the day you ask me that question, um, but certainly not for the rest of my life. And and I know that's a, it, it's such a ridiculous thing to say to someone who's to the majority of folks who don't have the opportunities that we've had to to pick these high leverage paths that we now can walk. Um, and and I, I think there's a lot to be there's a there's a lot that society still needs to figure out. In those ways, like I, I can't imagine being in a situation where you already have the kid and you already have, you know, the the grand the parents to take care of, and all you can do is work two jobs, minimum wage, to to keep the lights on. That's that's there's no way out of that. But is that noble? Absolutely. Is that meaningful? Hopes hopefully. Um, but 
um, that that's obviously a different path in, in life that than the one I'm living. And um, you know, I, I feel pretty grateful for that as well. And hopefully, in the long arc of things, you know, I, th- I think the the maximum utility, and I guess the the philosophy that we have to choose to believe is by doing stuff that people want, by building companies, by by building stuff, you are eventually making everything better. Um, it, it's you, know, you create inequality in the short term because, like, we have really well paid engineers here at Mapton, and and we're building stuff, and if people buy it, like, it it, it is a good outcome for us, obviously, and our shareholders. Um, but in the long term, what that creates is it's wealth for everybody. It creates the desks we use, the cars we drive, the electricity that powers our homes. Like, y- y- I guess I choose to believe in that framework. I'm pretty sure it's right, but I think there's that. I, that even might be a controversial statement in some circles today. And that's Do you okay. think like back to the religious, like, like this notion of faith is just like this trust that you can't prove. Like that's what faith is. Did you sure. feel like? a certain like that that word is very loaded but i feel like that's kind of what you're alluding to a little bit is like this i I choose to to believe that this is the case um it's well, kind of hard to prove or not or disprove yeah because because you can't like you know maybe one day we'll have like computers that can do ancestor simulations and you can build entire civilizations <laughs> uh in your computer and you can be like well what, what would have happened if like you know we just had a totally different way of uh, cl- collaborating as a species, um, you might even have to change like the way people are wired. In that case, like our our, our predispositions and our our basic drives, I would imagine. Um, but no, I think I think people even who have faith interrogate their faith in their own minds, right? Like you have to ask yourself at at some level if you're if you're a thinking person, and everyone is. Um, like, do it, why do I believe this? And and I think what I just said earlier is is essentially economics, right? It's it's economics that we take for granted for the most part, but at least there is a rigorous body of, I don't know, just just thought that has gone into this, um, right? I I remember as a kid, I uh, for whatever reason I went down the rabbit hole of, hey, I'm starting to really like living here. I really like living in Ottawa in the West. I really like our our common law system, the way society works. Why? Why does it work this way? Um, and and where did this come from? And then you like do your homework on that, and it, it's like seventeenth and eighteenth century Enlightenment thinkers in Europe, for the most part. Like it basically concentrates down to that, like Descartes, Hobbes, people like that, um, who who put in the time and really wrote out all these ideas, and and that led to the French Revolution, which led to you know like the and like France was like the biggest supporter of the U.S. when when they declared independence. And it led to you know like all those things, and it's 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 subtle, but it's also like not a default. The default for humanity is like hunter gathering uh, and, and raiding your neighbor. Um, so like, how do we get to this state where there's so much complexity, and yet now we have rockets that go to space? Um, it, I think it's a it, probably my favorite thing to think about because it's it's not an infinitely complex system, so. Which is why economics exists, but it's it, it's so cool that it works, um, and and it works, but it can be improved, right? Because the the current way that we take for granted called economics was written by other people, just like you and me, and and every now and then someone has a new idea, and eventually that takes off and gets heard, and people think hmm, maybe, maybe there's something to it, and and that it's the great debate rages today, so. Um, yeah, I, I guess one theme that's emerging from this conversation, for me at least, is I've always been interested innately in people games, um, right? It just, I think, mapped in, because uh, I, I think most most things really are, uh, and, and that's how you really get stuff done at the end of the day. Have you gone back like for significant periods of time to, to China since you came here as a kid? I used to go a lot. I don't go much anymore. Growing up, I probably went back every year. Um, you know, our our first place in Ottawa was pretty darn close to public housing, if I really think about it. Um, but my parents still made sure that they put me on a flight, sometimes by myself, to China, just to make sure I didn't lose touch with family, but also with the culture. Um, more recently, ever since I went to college, uh, less so, and 
in the very recent history, almost not at all. And I'm, I'm so many different reasons, but one of them is geopolitics, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks to see what's happening. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. It's, uh, the, partly why I'm asking is because like these, you were talking about the West and like appreciating how it is. And I think things have changed quite a bit in that time, uh, in China. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't, ah, boy, I'm going to get myself canceled by somebody (laughs) at, at, at the end of this one. Um, but I, I don't think it's all black and white either. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you can't discount the fact that a, a, a system that is so different than ours lifted like hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And I saw that, like I, I witnessed it, you know, um, it's hard to describe how poor China was when I was born in 91. Um, my parents talk about it. My grandparents talk about famine when like tens of millions of people died. And like when, when we look at North Korea today and we go, oh my God, what a, just an insane situation. Yeah, I've said that. Um, when I say that to my parents, they're like, well, it's kind of like when we were growing up. Like China went from North Korea to what it is today in their lifespan. Uh, and that's like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot that I wish would be different because I think I have just, I, I can't not be proud as a Chinese Canadian of what my relatives, but also like the, the, the tribe has done. Um, but I obviously, I do have a, an appreciation for you know, how much better it could be. Uh, and, and you wish people figure it out. So, but, but I, I do think that like, it's hard to find, um, it's, it's not that black and white. I was actually there recently for my grandma's hundredth birthday. And, uh, a lot of the things I really love are still there. Um, you know, people who like, it's a very family oriented culture. Like here in North America, we're all individuals. We're the, you know, we're the people that left our families and went on a yeah. boat or a plane. So like as a tribe, like these are where we're antisocial people. Um, <laughs> the old world is it's all about, you know, dinner, dinners and Sundays. Yeah. Um, so that's all still there. And, and I think the, the energy of the society to, to push kind of like how companies push is still there. Um, what really surprised me though, and, and bummed me out was how, uh, how, how quickly people spoke with anger with respect to the West. Um, you know, before five years ago, 10 years ago, when I went back, I would always say things like, well, you know, like, don't you guys want freedom? Isn't that just better? Like, isn't it nice to like have free speech and say whatever you want? And like, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, that would be nice. But here's the thing, Hong Wei, like, here's what we're trying to do. We were like, here's, here's all these problems. We need to fix these problems, but we're, we're trying to do things a different way. We're trying to build a better system. We're trying to, um, you know, like your company is a benevolent dictatorship. Clearly you think that's best. It's not a democracy. I'm like, yeah, that's Good true. Point. It is more, it is more efficient. Certainly. Um, right. Like we don't have three different teams inside mapped in building the exact same product and then picking the best one. That'd be so wasteful. Like we should just decide who are the best people to build it and say, you, 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 be, you people build that's it. That's a very good example. And, and, uh, but that's how the market works. So in the, in the West, so it's like, Hmm, that's pretty provocative. So I understand that. And, and it's a, it, it's, it's an intellectually honest discussion in the past where here's all the things we need to do before we get to where we're trying to go, but we're working on this project and, and it's going well. Um, and I, and I always, I think everybody could find that convincing or at least like, you know, if you're open-minded about it, you can at it's least a good appreciate what, yeah, what people are trying to say. And whereas today, trying the same line with the same tact, what I got back was, you know, you're just, you're just too American now. We would already be there if it wasn't for the US. We would already be there if it wasn't for the West keeping us down. The last time China was strong, 20, 20 uh, Western nations showed up and colonized us and like teamed up, which is true. Like you can't argue with like this, some historical accuracy to the 1800s and what happened there. Um, 
and and so it's it's like a it's a country that <laughs> to use a terrible analogy wants to make china great again and and most of them still believe in that and they're angry and they're angrier than i remembered and then if you get through the anger there's still the okay but yes these are still the problems that we must fix there's still things that we should do like but but it flipped um in terms of who what the source of the problems are and and the priority and that that bums me out i i have a completely untested yet still will say it theory that i think a lot of that comes from the fact that the languages have very very little overlap mm -hmm. i spent some time yeah. in russia a few years ago and one of the reasons i wanted to i went to study there a little bit and one of the reasons i wanted to do that is because if you look at the venn diagrams of the overlap of culture language yeah. and people i think russia and china are basically the furthest away from a lot of the not just english but i speak french i'm french I'm fluent in both languages. If I take those two Venn diagrams, French and English overlap like so much. A lot. Take any lot. other European countries. Yeah. Like basically there's differences, but but they're they're marginal. If you go to Russia, there's a little bit of overlap with the French, but there's not that much. And then if you take China and Mandarin, like it's even further apart. Yeah. And I think what that means is that you end up hearing about what happens there a little bit how back to you know the, the tribes and a long time ago like you heard things through the bard that came here and sang the song sure. of like what happened here which is a completely distorted weird legendary tale of what happened because you can't go and check it yourself and i think we talk a lot about the internet as having removed the yeah. boundaries but the there isn't one internet that there there are multiple ones that live kind of siloed between each other. Um, like WeChat is just a completely different thing. And you've got contact in, in Russia, which is kind of the same thing that I noticed, like I, I had never heard about. And it's- And a lot of countries just turn their internet off when they don't like what it's saying. Yeah, uh, and, and, right. and so I think we have this, and and I, I have that very often as well of, I have to remind that myself that like the, it's not that international and it's and if i go to other parts of the world it i think we all think that we're seeing the world as it is but we're actually not hearing from it directly and yeah and yeah i i when i was in russia i i talked to some people and they were saying like yeah you know what when uh before the soviet union fell down like everybody had jobs and it was not yeah. great, but like everybody had jobs. And you're like, yeah, that's kind of hard to argue against. And like, I, I've just tried to have a bit more empathy towards, maybe I actually just don't know what people are going through. And then believing well, that at the end of the day, people just want the best for their kids as well. And people seem to be good in most places. Like yeah. I, I, I like to, <laughs> I, I sometimes when I meet a new group of people and I start to get to know them, I'll start to like see what I can get away with saying, you know, um, only in safe spaces, of course, but Don't I worry, find I get listening. along, <laughs> I find I get along just fine yeah. with hardcore progressive people and hardcore Trump voters when we're talking about anything that's not politics, because they're just people. And they're probably good people. Like unless they're like actual sociopaths and murderers, like they're probably good people. And and they have interesting stories, and they just want to be heard, and and uh, and they have most of the same motivations as me. It's just we have this team thing going on with like politics and ideas that turns people's brains off. And and so obviously the most interesting conversations are with people who can be intellectually honest on on all subjects, including politics and including whatever. Um, but to your point, like almost everywhere, it's 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 just people. And and since you mentioned Russia. Um, there's not a lot redeeming you can say about the actions of Mr. Putin at this point. Um, and certainly in Canada, we have like one of the world's largest Ukrainian populations. So pretty unconflicted about that. Um, I, I think the Russian culture, though, is a little bipolar about are they European or are they Asian, right? 
Like in the days of Catherine the Great, they were European. They rebuilt their capital at St. Petersburg to be closer to the rest of Europe. Um, and and like in terms of culture, like Pushkin, Tchaikovsky, Dostoevsky, like these are these are greats. Um, and they're greats in the Western context because they punch through that language barrier. Um, and we all know their names and we listen to their music. So I, I, I think that there is like, it, I think Russia is closer, I guess is one thing I'm trying to That's say. That's fair. Um, because they've tried to be in the yeah, past. Yeah, I see what and, you mean. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, like the alphabet is a lot similar, like. Closer, it's, yeah. There is a lot more overlap. I, for sure. Yeah, and and whereas I think farther away than China might be parts of the world I don't know enough about. Like I'm sure there's parts of sub-Saharan Africa that are completely different. There's not to pick on anybody, but I think there are cannibals somewhere in the world still yeah. today. Uh right? <laughs> and and like I can't imagine why that's good, but I'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but again, yeah. So how how do you uh again like tangent one of the things i struggle with is um like how do you leverage the internet to get the most value out of it with the least polarization i'm like this is something yeah. this is a recurring thing i think about like finding people like you and, and having a conversation with them is the way i've found to try to do that is okay i'm gonna take the time to have these conversations because i've found that like for myself that was the the way to go i'm curious if you've had the same endeavor of trying to to get through to knowing about just getting in, informed or hearing about people despite i would say the yeah, yeah. polarization that's happening well i guess it's like you 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 develop your own um, you, you develop your own sense of who you are and how you want to present yourself and, and you get more confident over time and hopefully you never go too far uh, is, is it seems to be the path we're all on, right? Like we all, um, I, I think, look, my grandma doesn't give a fuck what she says at this point. She'll say anything. Dude, like she's she's gone through yeah. what, several wars, famine, like lives to a hundred. She just says her mind. Um, and and I respect it because her mind's great. Um, so we're all trending to there, right? You know how like the cranky old dude can just say outrageous <laughs> things on the street and you're like, oh, well, that's okay. Well, that's gonna, all going to be us someday. And so is that because we've lost touch or because we stopped caring? I don't, I don't know. I see. Um, I appreciate and, that. And, and I guess the the optimization we're trying to make is are we trying to live our own lives full stop or are we trying to change people's minds um and and i think if you're trying to change people's minds and you might have a good reason to do that i think most of the time you do if you're a kid you want chocolate and you're trying to change your parents mind if you're an adult you're trying to do stuff you're trying to be useful and you have to change people's minds so then you have to be very i think pragmatic about how you communicate, how you present yourself in a way that's authentic to you, in a way that's honest, but in a way that's intentional. Um, and, and I find a, a lot of the people I know who are like way past where we are, they don't need to care anymore. They can be a lot more unfiltered. Um, and, and they've earned that, like basically they're choosing, I, I've changed enough people. I, you know, at some point you've decided you've changed enough minds. It's time to just be me. I appreciate and, that. Yeah. I like uh, rounding these conversation off this the same way. Just like I, I like starting them with the same question. I, I, I end them this, with the same question. I like asking people for a, a book and a podcast recommendation. Not anything that we necessarily talked about. Like it really doesn't have to be linked to anything. And there's two reasons why I asked that. The yeah. first one is uh, a lot of books and podcasts travel through word of mouth still. And so you... Uh, there's a bit of recommendation algorithm, but it, a lot of the new books that I hear in podcasts I hear about are through word of mouth. And I always just like hearing about new stuff. And the second is, I think I always find it interesting as a different way to learn about someone and their interests sure. through what they read and, and might listen to. It's hard to pick one. I'll start out with the podcast. Um, I'm not going to go with Lex Friedman because I know you and I both uh, 
you know, use that as the bar. Uh, but I love Dan Carlin's podcast, Hardcore History. Love it. Um, and they're like five hour novels, basically. They're longer than books if you just type out the words he's saying. Um, so love that. Learn a lot about the world that way. Um, in terms of books, again, I, I, I think there's too many I've read recently, but probably one of the most impactful books on me growing up was J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye. I don't know why. I can't, I can't even tell you. I don't, I don't understand my own brain enough, but that book stands out. Sounds cool. I still haven't listened to Hardcore History. I, so many people have recommended over the years. I need to take some time to listen to that. Um, Thank you so much for uh, spending some of your valuable time with me. I, I really do appreciate it. I, I really appreciate you, Max. I, there's not a lot of people in the world, world who care about maps. Um, more and more every day, hopefully, every person we can shake on the street. So thanks for doing what you do. Yeah, I, this is slowly turning into a podcast where I trick people into coming in to talk about maps and we actually talk about life, the world, and everything in between. It's a better conversation. <laughs> well, thank you again. Hey, thank you so much for listening to this conversation. I wanted to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, but also all the people who financially support me on Patreon. If everything goes well, these conversations should feel and sound seamless and effortless, but there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. I try to research and prepare these as much as I can to know who these people are and what makes them interesting and what would lead to a good conversation. I'm incredibly thankful to all the people who support my work on Patreon, meaning I can do a little bit more of it. This podcast started out as a way to learn more about the people in this industry, but I've also started making educational content on another YouTube channel that I'll put a link to in the show notes. And I want to make more content explaining how satellite images and maps work to a broader audience, as well as continuing to research the guests for these podcast episodes. So if you value the work that I do, I'd like to ask you to please consider supporting my work on Patreon. There's also some behind the scenes of how this podcast is done and some of the work that I'm doing for these educational videos if you want to learn more about how I do all of this. Either way, thank you so much for all of your attention and your time. I really appreciate it and I hope you get value from these conversations. Thanks.